So now is the moment of truth. What do you think? So yeah, this came out of nowhere. Yeah, for those unaware, just recently there was a live-action adaptation to the car combat franchise, Twisted Metal, which came out on Peacock on July 27th. This was the action comedy that took everyone by surprise. Everyone. But to really get you guys to understand why, let's add some context. Twisted Metal was a really big franchise back in the day, coming out all the way back on the PS1. It was a car combat game where you drove around collecting weapons and power-ups so you can blow up enemies and win challenges. It had a number of titles, even surviving all the way to the PS3 era, though by that point it was already one foot in the grave and about to shudder for good, which sucks, because car combat games were a big genre when it was popular. You had Twisted Metal as the king, but you also had games like Vigilante. Some games even had spin-offs that were car combat, like Jack X Combat Racing, which fuck the haters, I thought that was awesome. Now, some of you might point out Mario Kart as well, but that's not really the same thing. Car combat is explicitly more aggressive and focused on the, well, combat. Mario Kart leads to real-life violence, sure, especially when that one cocksucker uses a blue shell, I'll kill your fucking dog. But the tone of something like Twisted Metal is different. It focuses on cars with specific loadouts and gameplay differences. A heavy semi will feel different from a sleeker car, and their weapons will reflect as such. There's a lot of thought put into how Twisted Metal games play, and some of you guys might actually have some serious nostalgia with this franchise. My personal two favorites are 2 and Black, which is a pretty safe opinion, because a lot of fans consider them the peak of the franchise, but hey, they were good. I even have a fondness for the 2013 reboot. It wasn't perfect, but goddamn does it feel like a breath of fresh air especially compared to how a lot of franchises were rebooted over the years. The only real flaws with it are lack of maps and playable characters, limiting you to just three campaigns. They get their own dedicated stories, but they don't get dedicated cars. Everyone just kind of picks from the loadout, and you go with what you like most, and you have to play through all three. Meaning you're essentially using the same playstyle over and over again for only three characters, which for a series known for its insane amount of variety is definitely a problem. Twisted Metal 2 had up to 14 characters who all had their own campaigns, vehicles, and endings. Now, the campaigns are just chucking you into different levels over and over again, but they still took the time to give them their own dedicated endings, which is one of the most famous aspects to the franchise. But we're not here to talk about the games, not in depth anyway. If you're disappointed, sorry, go to Tactical Bacon Productions for an in-depth look at Twisted Metal. All you have to know about Twisted Metal, at least for this video, is this. You have a tournament with a number of various psychopaths and murderers competing. They're all tasked with killing one another until one man stands victorious, and that winner gets a wish from an entity known as Calypso. He's Satan, if it's not obvious. Or more accurately, he might be a demon or a guy who escaped from hell who has the powers of a demon. It's not obvious, and the games reboot the lore each time anyway. But whoever gets their wish granted has an ironic comeuppance, since Calypso really likes to fuck with people who win his tournament. So he might have a situation where, for instance, a violent serial killer is trying to hunt down his daughter who survived the massacre of their family, this Twist Metal reboot's version of Sweet Tooth, by the way, only for him to be teleported into her grave because it turns out she committed suicide not long after the killings. So now he's buried alive and doomed to die. An ironic comeuppance, which is satisfying because the character is pure evil and deserves to get fucked over. And Twisted Metal is full of endings like this. Some are better than others. Black especially had some pretty great character endings, but then you had some that were just pure stinkers and not very good. Twisted Metal 3 and 4, I'm looking at you. Though at least 4 did have Dracula. 3 had Super Beast, but that game sucks so hard it's not even really worth it. Still, Twisted Metal has always been a pretty psychotic franchise in terms of themes, gameplay, soundtrack. Twisted Metal 2 has some of the best music on the PS1, not even fucking lying. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha! 
god, that's fucking good. Characters, the whole series just oozes chaos. So when it was announced that it would get a live-action adaptation, people were scared. For good reason, because video game adaptations have been extremely rocky, to put it very lightly. Sure, now they're getting better. Some people really dig the Sonic the Hedgehog movies, and Mario ended up being pretty fun even if it's blatantly for small children. We also had the live-action Resident Evil movies, the Netflix series that was... Uh, garbage. Also, Welcome to Raccoon City, which also sucked. Man, Resident Evil just always has these adaptations fuck up in new and unique ways. One of the most infamous examples is also the Doom movie, which was just a ripoff of the first Resident Evil movie, and it didn't even have demons. Uwe Boll was almost single-handedly responsible for killing any chance at a decent video game movie due to his shenanigans, to the point that, really, Running With Scissors specifically asked him to direct the Postal movie because he was so bad at it, which ended up making it pretty enjoyable when you consider the layers of meta-humor involved. Plus, not gonna lie, some of the jokes are just flat-out funny. Uh, well, we all hate Jews! Postal movie isn't perfect, but if you get the right group of friends together, it is fucking hysterical. But recently, you're seeing a push to take video game adaptations more seriously, which means they run smack dab into other issues, mainly corporate cynicism, but at least they're trying. First two seasons of Netflix Castlevania were legitimately fun, even if some elements are purely there to fill time it didn't matter in retrospect, like vampire politics. I have a lot to say about Netflix Castlevania, but uh, we'll save that for later. Regardless, you can see why people would be worried upon hearing that Twisted Metal is getting its own series. If done right, you could get a hyper-violent, insane action horror show that's like if Mad Max wore Joker paint. If done wrong, then you get Uwe Bolt. And some of the marking material definitely seemed like it was leaning towards the latter, since the first teaser they showed off was a fight scene from the second episode, where you see the iconic Sweet Tooth fighting a guy in a casino. And it was definitely not the best first impression. Tons of, dare I say it, MCU humor. Like it when the beat go. Da -da, da -da. Baby, let your booty go. Da -da, da -da. Will Arnett voiced Sweet Tooth and seemed to be doing his usual big dumb idiot shtick like he did in Arrested Development, and the fact they wanted to show off Twisted Metal without the cars spelled bad tidings. But when it came out, it was a different story. The Twisted Metal series is actually fun. Definitely not perfect, in fact I fully understand if somebody says they can't make it past the first episode, but this ended up being pretty enjoyable. The series was created by two familiar names, Rhett Reese and Paul Wernick, the guys responsible for writing Deadpool, Zombieland, Wayne, ultra-violent action comedies with vulgar humor. So really, Twisted Metal will be right in their wheelhouse. You're not expected to make Shakespeare, just make a dumb, fun car combat thing. They have experience with making solid stories with black comedy and creative action. I went into more detail about how these guys work in the Wayne video, but essentially they are able to ride the line between parroting a genre and being able to fit right into it without any issues. Deadpool pokes fun at superhero cliches all the time, but still works as a fun Marvel movie, and Zombieland is the exact same thing, outright addressing cliches and tropes of zombie fiction while still working as its own movie. <laughs> Zombieland 2 is a different story, but the fact that movie even came out is kind of a miracle in and of itself. But the point remains that these two are, at the very least, knowledgeable of story structure and don't just rely on fourth wall breaks. Hell, they're even capable of genuinely emotional moments. Some people have a point when they say that their humor is a tad to Reddit at times, but I don't think you throw the baby out with the bathwater since they are capable of genuinely funny jokes, stuff that can be clever or at the very least make you laugh. Now, Twisted Metal has had a ton of different reboots. Practically every game changed up how the game felt or who the characters were, even if they were legacy people. Sweet Tooth especially has had a bunch of different versions, though his black and 2013 designs have become the most iconic versions of the character. So the big question is, what the hell do you really stick with as a tone? Do you go full 2013 in black where it's a borderline horror show with tons of disturbing elements? Or do you play it safer and go with something like 1 or 2, where it's more comedic and lighthearted with only moments of disturbing? Well, the series decided to sort of do both where it's mostly funny with hints of a much darker lore behind it. Now to get the obvious out of the way, yeah, there's no actual Twisted Metal tournament. That's right, the entire point of the franchise, the fucking Twisted Metal tournament, is not in the show. Instead, the first season is all a teaser for the second, which will have the tournament. This is what I mean by some of you guys won't make it past the first episode, because that right there is a pretty egregious deviation. But there is a reason why they held off on it. For one, it's clear this show doesn't have the highest budget, there's some obvious CGI in places, and there's more of a focus on characters walking around the post-apocalypse than the car chases. 
Instead, those are saved for big moments, like the first episode in the finale. That's not to say the cars are completely ignored, in fact, their presence is pretty big. The setting has been changed to a post-apocalypse alternate history type deal. Y2K ended up being real, just a few years later than what people thought, and a collapsed modern civilization. So everyone holds up in various cities and settlements to avoid the roaming gangs of psychopaths that rule the land. Our protagonist is Anthony Mackie, who plays John Doe. Not that John Doe, at least I don't think so, but his name is absolutely a reference. There's a lot of references in this show, actually. Pretty much every character is someone from the game. It's kind of nuts. Back on point, John Doe is a courier that makes deliveries to various settlements, also known as a milkman. One day, he is approached by the ruler of New San Francisco, Raven, she's from Twisted Metal Black, and she gives him a job offer. Go to New Chicago and collect a package. Then bring the package back. The job sounds simple, but the rest of the country is a death trap. So while he is hesitant, but he is won over by the promise that he will be given a place in New San Francisco to live, meaning he can escape from his old life and get a new chance. Along the way, he runs into a woman named Quiet, she's made up for the show, who is traumatized by Agent Stone, a brutal dictator that runs a gang of police officers that are just as grisly as the criminals they hunt down. Agent Stone is from Black and he is played by Thomas Hayden Church. Yeah, Sandman is playing Agent Stone. There's a guy out there who's having a fucking nostalgia overload from that sentence alone. John Doe and Quiet team up and continue the journey together, at first an uneasy alliance that's quickly developing into a more intimate partnership. They run into all sorts of figures that have scraped together a life in the wasteland, seeing the different cultures and how this whole society kinda works. And they end up sparking off a war between Agent Stone and Sweet Tooth, an absolute maniac that is building up an army of his own. Now, the show is only about 10 episodes with about 30 minutes each, which I think actually works in its favor. The pace is fast enough to where it's never truly boring, even with moments of downtime. And if this tried to make every episode up to an hour long, I can easily see burnout setting in after a point. Keep it short, sweet, to the point. They keep it to the important details and build up what will eventually be used or addressed in another episode. There's parts that slow the pace, yes, but it never once felt as if it was wasting time or not revealing something new. And to its credit, the world they build up is actually interesting. A post-Y2K apocalyptic wasteland that's like a mixture of Mad Max criminals and some places that have actually rebuilt enough to come back to normalcy, even if some of that normalcy can still very much be twisted. I know some people say that's basically a ripoff of Last of Us, but I don't see that at all. Yeah, it's 20 years after an apocalypse, but the world that Twist Metal creates is far more over the top in Rule of Cool than Last of Us. Which is saying a lot, because that also dictated a lot of Last of Us's world building. As stated, there are certain areas that are basically back to normal, even if they have to address the possibility of raiders. It's all just excuses for why you can have car chases. It's not really meant to be this big thing that's explored and you talk about the fall of civilization. They even have hints to the supernatural elements, to the point that I'm basically convinced there will be a reveal that Clubso was somehow responsible for Y2K. Don't quote me on that, but it's a vibe I'm getting that it will be addressed. Now, the supernatural isn't all over the place. It's addressed as a thing, and Season 2 will double down on it, because it full-blown implies resurrections will happen, but it's not extensive in Season 1. Yeah, some people who die don't actually die, at least I think that's what the finale was saying. We won't know till Season 2 comes out, and in all fairness, this was a thing from the games. Not that plot armor is probably going to be a problem, it's more the fact of, yeah, they're going to bring people back in alternate forms or as different characters, I, it, it's just going to happen. Now the first thing to talk about is Anthony Mackie. He's the central protagonist and driving force behind the story, literally and figuratively. He's an amnesiac who has worked as a milkman since childhood. He doesn't remember his life before the end of the world, and has developed a coping mechanism where he's constantly making jokes or quips to get out of serious situations. But underneath that, you see that he wants to leave his life of constant fighting and killing, and more than that, he wants to find a place he belongs to, a home, or better yet, a family. A pretty simple character arc, yet it is effective. However, this raises the big question of how tolerable is he as a protagonist. A dude who is written to always talk can easily get on your nerves, especially if he is made to be annoying on purpose. So how bad is it in Twisted Metal? I'll say it's a mixed bag. When he's allowed to be genuine and shut the fuck up sometimes, Anthony Mackie does a great job in the role. He's got a charisma to him that can sell his likability, and the dude can be a legitimate badass when it comes to it. But this is where the script can weigh him down. I'm not kidding when I say the dude is stuck with nothing but MCU quips for most of his jokes. He's basically Deadpool. His jokes can range from a legitimately clever jab to just saying stuff until something lands. Okay, I have a question. It's not organs. Damn it, it's never organs. It's painful, especially in the earlier episodes. 
By the end, when his character arc hits its conclusion, I'd say it becomes a much better character. He takes stuff more seriously, and he's all around a bit more mature. In general, the episodes just get better and better as they go on, but I'll talk about that later. The big thing to mention is his relationship with Quiet. Quiet is the mute thief that he runs into in the Wasteland. The two are forced to work together after getting cornered by Sweet Tooth, and they develop a tense alliance as they both work towards their mutual ends. Quiet herself, played by Stephanie Beatrice, is another interesting character. One who is basically gimped by the Reddit humor. She's traumatized from living as a slave in Orange County, where punishments were severe for most of the minor infractions, such as losing a finger for going to the bathroom one too many times. Her and her brother killed their way out and struck out as thieves in the wasteland, where they are caught by Stone. Now she is alone and out to get revenge on Stone for the death of her brother, so she works with John, though she is quick to screw him over or leave him behind when it comes to it. Now I don't want to be that guy, but I noticed that this is another badass chick with serious trust issues that grows to love the main character and get over her trauma that Paul and Reese have included in something they've worked on. Starting to think these guys have a type. In all honesty, it's not a bad one. Yeah, Quiet is a fun character. While John tries to talk his way out of something before reaching for a gun, Quiet isn't shy about slitting a throat if it comes to it. It's an interesting dynamic, and you see how both options can fuck the two over. It's not like you have the competent one and the dead weight they keep around. No, it's an actual partnership. They watch each other's backs, learn more about each other, and soon allow the other to see their vulnerabilities. They have a good relationship, to the point that when they pull the Do You Care tests, I feel like they are effective. Now the big question is, how is Sweet Tooth? Yeah, Sweet Tooth is a very interesting element to the show. He is the face of the franchise, hands down appearing on basically every single cover of the games, and becoming a full-blown icon for PlayStation itself. I already mentioned that Will Arnett voices him, but the actual physical actor is Joe Sanoa, better known as Samoa Joe. And honestly, this was damn good casting. Sweet Tooth is a huge guy, but he's not really a guy like Arnold. He's schlubby. The dude's a psychopathic serial killer, he's not a bodybuilder. So getting a wrestler like Samoa Joe to play him was a good idea. He can be genuinely intimidating when he's pissed off, and Joe puts a lot of energy into the role. Will Arnett voices him, but I'm curious to hear a version of the show where Joe is doing the voice as well. I want to hear what he had in mind for Sweet Tooth, but the separation between the actor and voice actor implies you wouldn't physically see Sweet Tooth talk that much. And that's correct, he wears the mask the entire show, beyond one scene that's a flashback to his childhood, which is a major plus. They understood that Sweet Tooth works best when he is masked and faceless, and Samoa does a lot of acting with just his eyes, adding to the menace of the character. There are so many cases where a character gets adapted, and the producers or actor or whoever insist on taking off the mask of a character you're not supposed to see the face of. So Twisted Metal gets points for that alone, very good stuff. Now, the Marvel humor does impact Sweet Tooth as well. He can have moments of being the scariest motherfucker on the planet to doing an extended performance that's a glorified commercial for a hotel. It can be whiplash. But I think they managed to make it work when it matters. They understand how dangerous the guy is, and there's a lot of oh shit moments that are just addressing that Sweet Tooth is in the area. It's just a symptom of the larger issue that affects the show all around. And before you ask, Needles and Marcus are the same person in this. They don't address the multiple canes beyond his parents, but they might bring them in during a later season or something like that. We might see his brother, I don't know. Sweet Tooth's backstory in the show is that he was a child actor forced to do sitcoms by his parents who exploited him for money. He has a violent episode when filming an episode one day and was sentenced to Blackfield Asylum. Yes, Blackfield is actually canon and has since spiraled into the homicidal clown that we all know. But there's more to Sweet Tooth than just being a serial killer. He's desperate for approval and an audience. When John Doe runs into him, he's living in the ruins of Las Vegas, kidnapping any traveler that gets too close and forcing them to watch his show. And if he thinks you didn't like it, he chops you to pieces. This comes up later when he's convinced to take his show on the road and runs into Agent Stone's gang, sparking off a violent conflict between the two. Essentially two extremes clashing against each other, the embodiment of law and order and the embodiment of sheer chaos. What I like about this version of Sweet Tooth is that while he's jokey and can be goofy, the moments where he gets angry can be legitimately threatening. When you get to the finale, he basically abandons all pretense and is fully vicious. He even drops some of his iconic lines, with the best of which being the final line of Episode 9. <laughs> Time to play. Yeah, this show just seems to get Sweet Tooth. 
even with the dumb jokes they have him say sometimes. Now, Agent Stone is another interesting case. He's the leader of what's just called the Law in this setting, a gang of police officers claiming to be fighting back against the outlaws and trying to restore America. In truth, they're violent thugs that are little better than the guys they kill, even executing people for something as small as letting their dog shit on someone's lawn. Stone was a regular cop before the apocalypse. In fact, he was mocked and disrespected constantly. But once the world ended, all those same people that shat on him suddenly ran to him for protection, and would still disrespect him openly for it. So, he just kind of snaps and goes full lunatic and is out to punish anyone he views as a criminal. Honestly, he's a pretty good villain. Twisted Metal has always had a rebellious vibe to it, so making the main bad guy a police officer, a crazy one that demands complete obedience to law and order, is a great idea. And what I like is really, he's not a complete caricature. He does have reasons for why he does everything. He's so violent and resentful towards other people because he saw the worst of it when Y2K happened. People he considered friends and neighbors basically treat him like a joke and try to kill him. So why wouldn't he think, fuck all you people, and do his own thing? Now, some fans might be annoyed, because Stone in Black wasn't a bad guy. In fact, he joined the tournament because he failed to protect a family and wanted to get a second chance to save them. But once again, every Twisted Metal has rebooted details and characters before, plus even Black addressed that Stone was getting more violent and ruthless during his campaign. And as stated, the central conflict of the story is order versus chaos. You have the two extremes with Stone and Sweet Tooth, and everyone else is just sort of stuck in the middle. Speaking of chaos, how is the action? Honestly, it's pretty damn fun. While you don't see too many of the car battles, they still very much are a thing. And when they show up, they're easily the best parts of the show. There's tons of energy and creativity put into them. I can't say it goes full Fury Road, but it definitely has its own style that it works for. It's not completely perfect, because uh, the scene where Quiet beats a cop to death with a pistol is uh, pretty bad. She's so limp-wristed, yet there's blood flying all over the place. It's just, uh, doesn't have anywhere near the impact it was supposed to, you know? It's not the best. However, the car battle during the final episode was just damn fun, and I had a smile on my face the whole time. They even had fun little callbacks and references to some of the gameplay, like Sweet Tooth's Missile Barrage. There's not much logic behind them, you can rip the show apart if you're looking for plot holes. But to that I'll say, shut the fuck up nerd, I'll beat your ass when school's done. Meet me behind the fucking gym after I'm done fucking your mom. Yeah, the show doesn't care about making a logical story, it's very aware of how ridiculous the source material is, and isn't afraid of emulating that same vibe. You're watching because you like to see a drag racer outrun a homing missile, and trick it into hitting some other dude like it's a cartoon. Not because you want to see an actual homing missile and how it works. It's not full-blown cartoon logic, but you do get a scene where a guy with a massive penis smashes a watermelon, so set your expectations as such. I want to keep elements of this show vague, like I'm not going to talk about the entire cast, because there's a lot of people who do show up, and I'm not going to reveal much about specific story details. All I will say is that Calypso is very much a thing, he shows up in Season 1, and one of the more disappointing moments. It's one of those jokey bits that goes too far and is a blatant example of Reddit humor, where they point out how Calypso is a spooky bad guy and don't take him seriously. You can see it as dramatic irony, where these two have no idea how powerful the guy they're making fun of actually is. But to me, it was just annoying. I'm, I'm not a fan of this. It's kind of just worn out now. They saved it in the final episode, though, where they let Raven build him up without any interruptions, and it is meant to be an oh-shit reveal. Now, the last thing I do want to talk about is the soundtrack. The soundtrack is okay. You have a lot of licensed stuff, and since the setting technically only made it to 2002 before the apocalypse, there's a lot of 90s music that's used, which is fitting, because Twisted Metal was a 90s franchise. My big problem is you really don't see a lot of metal in the soundtrack, which to me is weird because Twisted Metal had a lot of heavy metal in the soundtrack. Now, obviously, maybe they couldn't afford stuff like Dracula, because as stated, this was a low budget, but you could have had something more, maybe remix some of the songs from the game. I don't know, something to give it a bit more bite. There was a lot of hip-hop, and some of it wasn't bad. I liked Going the Distance during the final fight. I thought that was actually a pretty good fitting uh, song for it. The problem is, you had some others that just were there, and it was just kind of, eh felt a little too much like it was trying to appeal to lowest common denominator greatest hits, rather than sticking with the identity of some of the games. You could have called Buckethead, maybe he would have been down for it, but I don't know. Regardless, this is all I'm willing to say about the Twisted Metal adaptation. I actually had a lot of fun with it, much to my surprise. I really can't oversell how hard I thought this show was going to suck. So this was a pleasant surprise, to say the very least. It's sort of like how One Piece live action seemed like it was going to be hot garbage, but fans of the manga say that the first season is actually pretty good. I wouldn't know, because I'm not a One Piece fan, because I actually talk to women. No, you don't. Sometimes it's good to be proven wrong, though. 
If they can iron out the MCU quips for Season 2, get a bigger budget, and go ballistic with the car combat, this could be one hell of a show. But for now, we only have Season 1. We got some teasers for who could possibly show up in the tournament. My guess is it's probably gonna be Axel and maybe Mr. Grimm, though he could also be No-Face. We, we, we just don't know just yet. Still, it's gonna be fun as hell when it comes out. You can check the show out on Peacock or your pirate side of choice, and I do recommend giving it a shot. You might end up having a great time. Until next time, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. See you guys. You... You... You said it would be easy! Do you know what they did? Do you? You? Now it's my turn! It's my world! It's my word! It's my turn! It's my day! Hey, loser. Do you want a shirt? Do you want a t-shirt? I have shirts now. Look in, look in the description for a link to a t-shirt you can buy. If you don't buy the t-shirt, I'll kill your family. If you don't buy the t-shirt, I'll poison your dog. If you don't buy the t-shirt, you're gonna be the only person in town that does not have a t-shirt. Everyone's gonna look at you funny. There's gonna be social consequences to not having one of these t-shirts. I'm now making express threats of violence against you if you do not buy my t-shirt. I will call the police, tell them how they're not, you know, you're not buying my shirt. They're gonna plant crack in your house, and they're gonna arrest you and then beat you up in a jail cell. Buy my shirt.